the first one is actually Lily Allen's Not Fair. Oh, yeah. Believe it or not. And anytime anybody asks, they're like, have you a team song to sing? Like when we did the uh, the documentary, The Blue Sisters one, they're like, and what song do you usually sing after you win? And we were like, not appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> like, not that one. Mickey Hart here. You're listening to GA Hour Football Show. The GA Hour with Colin Parkinson is brought to you by Paddy Power, home of the Money Back Special. I'm not finished yet. It took me a long time to get here. 60 minutes, 9 scores, a lot of rain and a third All-Ireland for Mick Bowen's Dublin team. Welcome to the GA Hour, I'm Conan Doherty. We have Noel Healy popping into the studio with us uh, in a bit and I'm joined here by Mayo manager Peter Leahy. Peter, you're probably happy to get the break now for a bit, are you? Well, I wasn't happy on Sunday when I was sitting watching <laughs> it and we were a kick ball away from being in it um, and to have to watch through 60 minutes of, of the game that was in it it wasn't <laughs> Jesus, it tough. wasn't it was tough now it was tough going I mean there was a lot of hard tackling and a lot of good tactical stuff but it, it was a poor spectacle of, of a game to be honest with you were you watching that thinking oh we we could have had a big chance Dublin only scored 2-3 like you know you could have got them that day yeah well anyone who knows me and the way, way I set teams up is to actually have a go and have a, have a cut and you know and sometimes that exposes you as it does um, but you know we would have had a go at Dublin and you know we would have really had a cut at them but it's very hard to watch you know a team scoring four points it's you know five scores to four it's really really tough to watch mm. um, it was tough to watch from my point of view but I'd say everybody that was around me was finding it tough to watch as well <laughs> yeah. you know it's it was it was a poor spectacle and I, and I don't buy the, buy the rain scenario at all. We all play in rain. Yeah. Um, you know, I've we, I've been involved in plenty of games. We were involved in the Connacht final this year with Galway in absolute torrential rain and it was a cracking match. You know, uh, Jerome Quinn said it was the best football football game he's ever seen and that was in pouring rain. So, like, it, it, you can you can make excuse you want but it was only drizzle. You know, yeah. it, it, was, it was drizzle. I mean, you, you watch the All-Ireland Hurling final, that was real rain, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and that was a, a good spectacle. So I don't think you can use uh, uh, weather. And, and and it's kind of patronising because we, we're trying to make excuses. Uh, Absolutely. You yeah. know, there's no excuses. Mick, a bad game. Mick, Mick Bowen and, and Noel Healy who's coming in and none of the Dublin girls should make excuses. They're all Ireland champions. They should not oh, make excuses. Yeah. And it's brilliant and it's fantastic. And, you know, three in a row is, is an amazing thing. But let's not hide from the fact that it was a poor game of football. Yeah, like, I completely agree. And, like, yeah, it's tough. It was tough conditions in that they were, they were slipping and dropping balls sometimes. But as you say, they've, they've played in the rain before. And to be honest, any game that ends up with nine scores in 60 minutes, it's not a good game. And there's no point in saying anything else. I, I see Maloney score seven points in, 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 from play in an intermediate game. She didn't find it too tough. And, and Ashley Maloney didn't play as good as she can do. Yeah. I mean, I know Ash well, and she's a, she's probably one of the best players in the country. And Ashley admitted herself she had three straight wides in a row that you, she would normally pop over the bar. She still got seven points from play. And you can say it was a looser game or whatever the case may be. But their shot selection and their shots were way better in the intermediate game than it was. I mean, I, I don't buy into the, the weather. I, it was down to the fact that teams they tactically set up and... I would say Galway set up very, very negatively. Now, they, they set up to have a go at them very early on and push up at them, but they they went very, very negative. At, at a lot of stages, with 14 people behind the ball. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, and I can, in a way, I can understand Tim Rabbit's scenario because we opened, we had 39 scoring shots against them in the semi final, and they probably thought to themselves, if, you know, we missed 13 of them and put four, four into the goalkeeper's hands, and they probably thought to themselves, if Dublin get these chances, I mean, Mayo's shot selection was poor. Dublin won't have poor shot selection and we could be out the gate before we know it. So I can understand them shutting up shop to a certain extent, but you have to try and win the game. And I don't think Galway went to win the game. That's what I would have a problem with. So this is what I want to ask you about, actually. I'm a little bit worried that the blanket defence might creep in mm. a lot into the ladies' game. And like the big fear is you saw it there on Sunday. Like if Galway get 13, 14 players behind the ball, it's... Like for the most part, like the ladies aren't kicking it over from as far as the men can, so it's a smaller area that you only have to contain. So if you can get thirteen players into that area, he can block it up a lot easier. Like you know, say in the men's game, for the most part, you have to cover the whole forty-five. And anyway, Dublin showed the way around that in the men's game, but now in this game, it seems like you can get an advantage by doing this. If you can get a team fit enough to break from, and now don't forget they have to go further with the ball because they can't kick it as far. So yeah. they have to go, it, it is a more difficult thing to do. It's an easier thing to defend against. You can shut a team out. Um, I mean, we did it against Dublin last year when when we lost a lot of players yeah. and we had to shut up shop. And it's the first time and only time I've ever done it. And we frustrated them for 45 minutes. 
there was only I think we were level with, with 15 minutes to go and they pulled away because we couldn't sustain what we were doing mm. um, it's it's a very difficult thing to do in the ladies game it is creeping in more and more and more we've come across an awful lot more defensive teams uh, trying to shut up shop and it takes away from the game that I love which is attacking football you know try and score more than the opposition and let's see how it goes tighten it up at the back but let's not drop 10, 12, 14 yeah. people behind the ball Um you know, it, I, I have a big fear of that. I have a genuine big fear of it. It's something that if it creeps into the ladies' game, I, I will struggle myself personally as a, as, a, as a coach to, you know, stick with stuff that is going to become quite defensive. I won't blame Dublin for the defensive setup because Absolutely. if a team is playing defensive against you, you obviously have yeah. spare players back. So what Dublin did wisely is when they stopped them before they got to halfway uh, and blocked up the yeah. area because they had the spare players there. So I wouldn't say, uh, you know, Dublin's played it negatively, even though the game struck negatively mm. um, and I totally get where Tim and, and Galway were coming from they did want to stay in the game but staying in the game you have to have the quality to finish it in the end you look at the Tyrones of the past and the Donegals of the past they always had enough to get ahead mm. and you know if you get a lead that's fine you know you can you can possibly shut up shop, shop then but when you're scoring one point and a half like 22 minutes before a score yeah, it's, almost 23, yeah. It's, uh, you know, there was people beside me betting would, would we get a 0-0 zero, zero at half time. And that's, some, like, uh, when you're involved heavily in, in ladies football and only kick away from an All-Ireland uh, final, you know, as a manager, I'm going, this doesn't bear well with me, you know, in in my own head of, of how the game is going, if that's an advertisement for the game. Having said that, there was an awful lot of good things in the game. There was mm. some, some tremendous tackling. The defending was oh, amazing tremendous, as well. Tremendous, fairness, tremendous. Yeah. I mean, you know, Galway and Dublin probably are the two most physical te teams in the game. Yeah. You know, we've played both of them and, and literally they will throw their bodies at you. They will hit you as hard as you can. And again, this is a bone of contention for a lot of managers, and I've talked to a lot of managers, and we one manager stepping away because of it, Aoife Fitzgerald is stepping away from Cork because of the referee and of the tackle. You know, it's so inconsistent from referee to referee. Brendan Rice did a tremendous job on the final. I have to say, absolutely brilliant job in the final. Um, Gary Owen did a brilliant job in the final last year. Uh, they they let the game develop the way it yoke. You know, so we either have to change the rules of ladies football, which is a non-contact thing mm. and stop fooling ourselves because it is contact and they're all built they're all in gyms now they're built to take contact or we go back to it it's non-contact and we we we, in, we endorse that and we go with that but as a, a coach for me it's very very difficult I've talked to all the other coaches in the same boat how do we set our team up do we set them up to tackle very similar to the men's game which Dublin do at the moment and, and Galway do very similar contact put the body in put the chest on put the hands in you know, get the hit on, like they, they dive in for the hit and that's great. I love, I, I actually would love to coach yeah. a team that way because I'm from the men's game and that would be so easy for me. It was one of the criticisms when I got into ladies football first, I was teaching them how to tackle like men and we were getting fouled off, <laughs> yeah. off the park, being yeah. honest with you. Um, so we changed around and, and looked at the rules and we, and we try and do it hand in only when the ball's out. It, that's great if it's, if it's refereed that way, but it's not being refereed that way at the moment. Yeah. Inconsistently. And as a coach then you don't know what referee you're going to get from from one week to the other. And you don't know what referee you're dealing with. You could be dealing with someone in, in, in the stands as well. But we leave that <laughs> <laughs> Leave that for another Yeah. <laughs> well in the stands on the on the final day, obviously obviously was a record attendance, um fifty six thousand one hundred and fourteen. And <laughs> you put that into context, in France at the World Cup soccer final between USA and Netherlands you had fifty seven thousand nine hundred. So <laughs> Just like under 2,000 shy of that of a World Cup final. So it's obviously great. Um, of It's over three games. We, we know that. And I was, I was going and I was guilty of going in for the second half of the intermediate match. But even as I was going in for that, there were people coming out. And like people were going out before the senior game as well. So I don't think he had 56,000 at the one time there. But he did have a hell of a lot of people there. I'd say he probably still had over 45,000 at any well, one Well, it was time. 56 through the gates, which is uh, through yeah. the turnstiles, which is an amazing figure. And, and you know, credit goes to uh, to the people who have organised it and pushed it and really, really, yeah. you, know, you know, year on year. I mean, I seen a statistic the other day that five years ago it was as low as 24,000. Yeah. And now we're at 56,000. It's, it's incredible how quickly. So, so everybody that works in that. But, you know, what I would say about that is there's pros to that and huge to that. And the game is 
really moving on and it's it's a spectacle you see the, the coverage that the ladies get the media coverage they get you know uh, even us managers get more media coverage and, and so on and so forth so there is a respect element coming to the game mm. because it has become such a like we train the exact same as the men you know you know we have even the same, same strength and condition coach in Mayo as, as the men we do all the same type of training the amount of the hours the, the national league so there's the respect element is coming there and it's it's developing but in comparison, the LGFA and, and the GA. I mean, I'm involved in GA most of my life. I've only come over to LGFA recently, and the the, the comparisons are wh- what a million pounds made on on the turnstile the other day, and not one penny of it comes back to the to the counties. Not one penny comes back to the counties. So there has to be questions about you know if they've if they've doubled their attendance, that means they've doubled doubled their revenue. Our our costs are going up by double to run a a, a, a team in that five years. Uh, a senior team, you know, to get nutritionists, to strengthen condition, you know, has doubled. Buses have doubled in price. Food has du- doubled in price. Still, we're getting no help from from the LGFA. Where's whatsoever. Where's the money going? I, I don't know. Not one penny comes to 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 the to the counties. Yeah, that's not like you know, with all the criticism we we give the GA throughout the year, like you know, the money does go back. Like for a large part, it does go back. Yeah, into and and possibly the, the LGFA will come on and answer it, 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 that it goes to the underage or whatever. But from me, from a senior point of view, in a senior, senior county, we don't get a penny. We don't receive a penny. Our 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 organisation, Mayo LGFA, don't receive a penny from it. And and like, and then like anything, it's it's the players who suffer and and the coaches. It's. Like they're not getting the same treatment, and I, and I always hate that. You see, when you join a club at under eight level, like you're just joining a GA club, but then eventually, when like you know Grace Kelly grows up, she's no longer part of the GA. She goes into the LGFA, and she's not getting the same treatment. She doesn't have the same access to the pitches, like you know, automatically, because it's not part of that umbrella. Yeah, and and I think it, it, it's it's moving towards, uh, well, in my opinion. It, there's probably an awful lot more to it in the background than I don't know about boardrooms and what happens. But it, it, it would make sense that the game is practically identical. The teams are identical. We're doubling up now on on, on in matches and, you know, the ladies are playing before the men and so on and so forth. I, I can't understand why we can't be the one organisation. Um, surely there's a way of doing that and surely there's a way of the GA helping us as well as mm. us helping them. Uh, um and, you know, we don't look for very little. I mean, we have girls coming from Watford, we have girls coming from Limerick, we have girls coming from Dublin for the training, out of their own expenses. Not one bit of expenses can they so get. So they don't get expenses? Not expenses at all. None whatsoever. Whereas I, I deal all the time, I used to be involved in inter-county men's, and all of them get taken care of for their expenses, and rightly so. You know, it's, it's a tough mm. job to train five days a week. You know, they don't even get gym membership anywhere. They don't get any help whatsoever. None whatsoever. And... It comes down to finances. It does come down to finances and, and not having it. But we have big sponsors in the LGFA. We're a big organisation now. Um, you know, it's possible that there should be more going towards the the, the players. And I, I don't mean directly. I mean, even indirectly. You know, how do you afford, afford a nutritionist? You know, how do you afford a strength and condition coach? I mean, there is no financial help. So this, so this is interesting because I was chatting to Neve Kelly a couple of weeks ago and she was talking about the strength and conditioning that you're doing in Mayo and how you're doing the exact same as the men. How is how, how are you doing that? Is that a Mayo we, thing? We get, we get a, an, a national grant of 9,000 from the Sports Council of Ireland. 9,000 yeah. for the year. 9,000. I mean, it takes 160,000 to run our organisation, our senior team. Um, all the rest of it, some part of it comes from Mayo LGFA. The rest of it comes from friends, family, bit of fundraising. We're out every day, like not not trying to blow trumpet, but I cook the food myself because we can't afford to mm. to to uh, get catering. So, I mean, we're not the only county doing that. So you're cooking the food for after training. Yeah. So like every night, like every, every night. Yeah. So you take you take for twenty odd people. Well, thirty five odd people, <laughs> forty with management and a whole lot. But that's not the, and I have no problem with that. That's not an, an issue for me. What the issue really is, at what stage, you know, and it's probably our job to get the finance together, but it's only so much you can get. And there's only so many times you can ask and there's only so many times things. We do need help from our the head organisation. That's where, like, if we have 56,000 people in Crow Park, there's a lot of money there. So, you know, let it filter down and teams, even small bits, small bits, are, are huge for us. Any kind of like that nine thousand government grant is huge for us. Mm. But I mean, nine thousand wouldn't cover your physio bill for the year. You know, uh, nine thousand wouldn't. You know, we have a strength and condition coach the same as the men. 
and we have people helping him or as in financially helping him giving him the money for us ordinary Joe Soap's helping us putting their hand in their pocket and that's great that's what the GA is made for and it's what it's about well and the LGFA is the same but there has to be some financial assistance somewhere along the way yeah and like you say 56,000 obviously 5,000 up on last year the semi-final was 10,000 and if I'm not mistaken that's 10 times more than was at the semi-final yeah but it was, I was at the semi-final it was, it was poor enough and, and listen I have to say the work that they're doing uh, in uh, the LGFA yeah. I, mean, I mean the people like Karen and people like that in the LGFA are just literally working mm. non-stop and they work their backsides off to get to where they do and it's not easy I'm not saying it's easy uh, and I'm not saying uh, possibly the money's not there I don't know maybe it's not there and if it's not there fine but you know things have to be addressed for equality you know I, there's a big as we all know the big talking point at the moment is about money for that Dublin are getting over other teams in the men's um, I don't buy into that to be honest I, I think the big advantage Dublin have both men and women is that they can collectively train within a half an hour of each other in a main city and I think our games are going to a stage where it'll only be cities who are who are thriving who have the employment I mean you look at the Mayo men half the lads work in Dublin well a good majority mm. of them and have to ferry the whole way down it's a long distance we're the same we've guards in Limerick we've guards in Dublin with guards in Cavern with one girl over in the UK that has to come home thing and we have to that's what we have to do so in order to have a collective session we have to have one month in advance one month to decide whereas Mick could call a session and a half an hour later all the girls are there Yeah, and that's not his fault or it's not anyone's fault but I don't buy into the money factor because I don't think money buys, buys your players but it's down to the collective training and you know that's that would be a big issue for for us as a team, very big issue. And it's not just the uh, county level. There's issues. So club championship is actually back tonight in Dublin. So Cooler are playing Scaries, and that affects three players who are playing on Sunday: Lindsay Davy for Scaries, and Martha Byrne and Jennifer Dunn for Cooler. Um, so like they played on Sunday and all are in the final. They've been celebrating since, and now they're playing a game tonight, a championship match, semi final of that. Uh, the Scaries coach Johnny Biggs was out uh, talking to saying it's absolutely crazy Lindsay has to play a very important club game just three days after she covered virtually every blade of grass at Crook Park that's pretty uh, fair to say um, since the Ireland final Lindsay has understandably been bonding with her teammates and celebrating the win over Galway so it's very unfair that she has to play a club game so soon after Sunday that is a bit mad isn't it firstly Lindsay Davy was aw- awesome in the game <laughs> she was awesome Lindsay Davy was you know absolutely I think was the player of the match uh, herself and Siobhan McGrath I thought were yeah. just phenomenal yeah. I thought the um, goalie was the same I thought she was phenomenal it wasn't a day for forwards you can't talk about any of the re- real forwards in the game but for them to have to go out in championship listen I, I understand it from both points of view and this doesn't come from Dublin LGFA this comes from Leinster who you have to get into a competition and play in the Leinster championship and it doesn't really come from uh, Dublin at LGFA are putting them out yeah. because they have to get the games off in order for the team that represents Dublin to be in the Leinster Championship and it's really really unfortunate the way it's done and I think they probably could get a help from the Leinster branch by moving the the time scales back because um, I think that's really really unfair on them guards and it's unfair on their teammates who obviously feel for the players as well having to do that Um but there's no doubt Lindsay Davis still go out and have a have a have, have a cracker. That's the only thing because she's like an energy bunny. She just keeps going, you yeah. know. So I would don't think. But it, listen, it's it's the same in the men's, the same as in, in anything else. I I wouldn't like to get into fixtures because you get into a, a quagmire completely on on fixtures because it 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 changes. I see in our we're we're out in Mayo. It's out on Friday night as well. And again, we've intermediates out tonight and Sunday for the final semi final tonight or, to, or Friday night and uh, Sunday final because they have to get into the kind of competition oh yeah so it's it's like uh, the way I would I would do it with, if I was in Dublin I, I would just go listen guys if you're happy enough if to get the four teams together if you're happy enough not to compete in Leinster you know we'll, we'll give you another couple of weeks and we'll we'll do it but no one wants that they want to get through and they want to represent Leinster and to get into an All-Ireland series you know Yeah. so it's 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 a, the, the way to, to do it is to put your All-Ireland back further maybe um, all Ireland club final back further and then all your, your matches from that because it's very unfair for the two teams I mean, Galway are going to be in the same boat uh, the Galway players are going to be in the same boat and you know it's hard enough win or lose a, 
it's easier when you win now to, to, to celebrate and go than it would be to lose yeah. and then go back into it's a game. That's, to, that's yeah. exactly what. So the, the Galway guys are going to be in the same. I feel sorry for the guys, but I just don't think there's a solution to that, an easy solution to that. Yeah. And, you know, the manager, I can understand him coming out and saying it's very unfair. Yes, he's dead right. He's dead right to say it's very unfair. Um, but there's a lot of things unfair in GA that we won't be able to, <laughs> we won't be able to <laughs> we'll solve. Be here all day. <laughs> Not in this hour, anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, up next, we'll uh, have a look at the game. Okay, so Dublin 2-3, Galway not 4, rivet and stuff, but um, like you mentioned, Peter, like Galway went super defensive. Um, Anya McDonough and Sarah Keneally, from what I could see from the Kuzik stand, they were like the only ones in attack for, for most of the game. Um, Tracy Leonard got up when she could, but for large parts it was just everyone just swarming back, getting in front of the goals. Yeah, and, and the real catalyst was um, Nissa Lynn turned over a ball in just outside her own 45 and she burst it forward in the second half and there wasn't one maroon jersey in yeah. front of us, and she had to turn back and that while it's very important to, to stop a, a team scoring there's a time when you have to and in fairness to Tim Rabbit I watched him on the sideline trying to push them on Yeah, but when you come with a game plan you, it's very hard to change it midway through the game and people to realise and at that stage they were tired they were out on their feet they had one game plan to try and get Louise Ward coming through the middle on ball and Olivia, De- Olivia Divid had a very very good game but they, to try and get them coming through uh, on the ball as fast as they could but be, by allowing the players Dublin players stay back all that McGrath and them and, and Goldie have to do was block the middle and the minute Louise got on the ball they crashed into her and stopped her and turned yeah. her back and Galway went back with the ball. You quite often you see the first thing Galway did was give the person coming behind them. Yeah, you know they didn't kick the ball in at all. Um, Tracy had, hadn't one of her better games. She was marked out of the game again, same way as in our semi final. Didn't get much much of the ball. And it seems when Tracy seems to be taken out of the game, Galway struggle because the, the only person they kick past the ball is, is Tracy, and she's probably the only one who kicks past it in, inside to her sister. So, you know. Uh, um, the, or cousin, so the the only thing I would say is Galway went with a plan they stuck with it they frustrated Dublin very much frustrated mm. them um, I would fear that other teams will look at that going oh we can stop Dublin getting a run on us yeah. but, but you know Galway's game is and what, what, what troubled us with Galway is they have such a good running game and they trouble you off the break so badly against us every ball was head head in the final on Sunday everything was behind mm. which really shocked me and it was a change of tactic and I can understand as I said to you already I can understand because we opened Galway up so yeah. badly I can understand them fear in Dublin um, but I, I believe you go into a final yes you go in with a tactic I mean you look at the men's game I thought Kerry's tactic starting off kicking high ball in when, when Walsh wasn't there as another crazy thing but we you go with it and you see what's happening yeah. and you know, Tim. Then you adapt him. Yeah, but yeah. Tim went with his with his with his, uh, his game plan. It worked to large extent. I think he tro- was hoping to get a lead early because Galway put a lot of pressure on very early, and I think he was hoping to get a couple of points <laughs> up and then sit back. Yeah, see, that's the thing. I remember we we played as a club level a few years back, right? And th- like we had all these pointers and stuff for our tactics. We had to read every night, but the first point was we absolutely have to be in the lead. Yeah, and it's like, well, what sort of tactic is that what happens if we don't get in the lead then it's not really a valid tactic and as soon as Dublin scored the goal then Galway are thinking Jesus we're, we're three points down here I don't know where I learned very quickly from an, a, a, a coach a very very good coach um, one of our best coaches in the country um, in a different sport never predict what's going to happen because it'll never happen so if you yeah. say if you say you must do anything then it completely goes out the window if it doesn't happen Yeah. so to say we must score off the kick or off the throw up yeah that's great, but if it doesn't happen, your whole game plan is affected to it. So, must is a is a is a is a hard thing to say, and it appears to me now it could be totally wrong. They were hoping to try and get a lead on them, yeah. and be able to sit back then because they did press very high. They did a high press on their kickouts. They put Dublin in trouble for the first ten minutes. Genuinely put them in trouble. Didn't have an end product. Didn't have a finished mm. product. But they put them in trouble, and then from there on in, it was all sit back play. Yeah, and no, this was a strange thing. So when you looked at individual battles. 
Like Sarah Lynch had a stormer. She was marking Eve McAvoy, and she just kept picking her pocket. Sinead she Burke, yeah, Sinead Burke went on to Sinead Heron and like nullified her. Orla Murphy had a tougher time on Hannah O'Neill. Nicola Ward went out and moved out to Carla Rowe, and they all did relatively well. Like like the forwards we're talking about there for for Dublin, but they did well. They held their own. They probably didn't need all that help. Well, Galway are some of the best man man markers in yeah. the game. Like you know, you look at Nicola Ward. You look at I mean, my my opinion, pound for pound, um, Burke is as good of. A marker you're ever going to going to see now she's exceptionally physical and I don't know how she gets away with some of it but yeah. I like that about her yeah. you know what I mean I like that she's 100% on and she goes for everything and you know there would be some of the best man markers and then they bring people back for the sake of bringing people back like I mean if you it, it, uh, you know, and I get it, it's worked from all year. He's only lost two matches all year, you know? Yeah. So you can't really come in. He lost the league final and the and the All Ireland final. So you can't really complain that it's a bad system they have. Mm. I just thought they went exceptionally neg- negative for the final. That's the only thing. Like they did change their game from when they played us mm. completely. Because they've got like a, a middle eight there that's that's fluid, it's fast, it could it could cut you open. But as you say, they had nobody ahead of them. So again, it sort of restricted them. Yeah, well, I mean, show again and Olivia Divley and and um, um, Ward and 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 people like that. I mean, Glynn is a phenomenal player, and they've pace and power and. But they were picking up the ball inside their own 45. Yeah. And it's very hard to attack a team then, you know. It's very easy as a Dublin t- side or anyone else to man-mark people 70 yards in the distance from when a ball's coming. You know, yeah. it's 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 an ex- ladies football. You're not kicking at 70 yards. So you've all the time in the world to mark your player and get it out in front of your yeah. player. So it's very hard to kick a ball in. And that's what happened against Galway. They, they couldn't pick it. Now, having said that, Dublin couldn't play their kicking, kicking game. Dublin, you know, you, you you look at Carla Rowe, who was phenomenal in the semi-final, mm. and she got no ball because yeah. there was no ball to be kicked. It was it was all, there was no space in front of her yeah. at any stage to get a ball to her. And then you've seen Noel Healy come on, who, who's a phenomenal player, and she had to go the whole way back yeah, to, pick to it get up. ball mm. and to come on it. And you don't want her running at you, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, I worked with her in UCD and she's just a phenomenal pace and a phenomenal footballer. And, you know, you could see how much it mean, meant to her getting that point in the end, you know. Yeah. It meant so much to her. She's had a hard injury. She's working in Cork. She's joined a Cork club. Um, her, her life seems to be down in Cork mm. and, it is phenomenally hard to try and train and come up like what Dublin had with Noel we have with so many players that transport thing and the whole thing and I know she had injuries but a lot of that's to do with being in a car for three hours to come to train and yeah. you know uh, you pick up hamstrings and different things because of that you know physically it's very very hard to be sitting in a, on, on a, in a car for that long and then come out and train so for her to come on and, and score a point, I was delighted for her now, I have to say. Yeah, like for for me, so I think Dublin, four of the forwards probably didn't really feature as much as they would have liked, but they still had Lindsay Davy, as you said, and they had Hannah O'Neill, who just didn't stop. Like, she, like Even though there were so many Galway players back, she just kept finding these spaces, picking up the ball, so much energy, like she was a dream full forward to look up and find. Well, that's a credit to Mick, really, and, and Ken and all the rest of them, that she comes in from... Um, a minor setup last year or whatever and you know uh, Mick used the league this year very 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 wisely he went through a lot of players he 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 developed his squad and he's now four or five players tipping him because he, it's the honest truth is he has a good few players at the cusp of, of retirement yeah. and he needs to create another set of players to come in in the panel no one knows more than me about recreating players <laughs> but the, the fact is he's brought them through a, a National League campaign and he didn't put an emphasis on the National League you know even though they were title holders he definitely didn't put an, mm. an emphasis on the National League I know when we played them he tried so many players and we they, they got uh, got us in the end but we had them for long periods of time and I know he was trying players out and he was trying systems and he was trying everything and you know I know Ken quite well and Ken would have been keeping the fitness levels and peaking for, for the championship and they did that I mean they were phenomenally fit and strong Um and the, these in, injection of the few players have made a huge difference. You know, Jennifer Dunn has been a hu- huge player for them, you know, this year. Um, you know, O'Neill, definitely huge player for them. Yeah. Like, I mean, they've lost players as well. And, you know, they're probably, and I'm not saying preempting a lot of people, but there's a few people in an age bracket there who could just easily, three in a row, be happy enough with that. Mm. You know, there's a lot of them being on the run quite a long time, you know. But these older w- women, 
were actually some of the best players. You know, you look at you look at Siobhan in midfield and, and Lindsay, uh, they just were phenomenal. I mean, Lindsay, they recovered every blade of gla grass, but she does that all the time. Yeah. And she's an unsung hero all the time. I mean, she's a player, we fear the minute she's on a, on, on, yeah. on a sheet, we go, oh God, she's going to do so much work, you know, and she's going to work so hard. I mean, uh, Goldie went through a lot of um, injuries this year, oh, up and ba back and, you know, different things with her hamstrings and, and I think her glutes or whatever it, it is. And she's had a lot of trouble. And for her to perform in the last couple of games at like that, mm. it shows you that the Dublin management and their staff, their medical staff, their strength and condition staff are phenomenal. They get the players at the right time in the right condition, you know, and a big credit goes to Mick for, for that. He's a really good quality coach and he's a good quality manager. Yeah, they were just like, yeah, they were well set up. They were set up for 60 minutes rather than trying to get in the lead. And like they kept the halfback line in place with with Goldrick sort of sort of marshalling the whole thing, McGee and McGrath. You might they are just like some bit of stuff the two of them. Like and they just took turns. I thought it just you know going back and like just keeping an eye on the ship and making sure nothing got past. And then you say Lindsay Davy, like she's an unsung hero, yes, but like it's not like you know, she's one of these people who does a lot of work and then passes it off she just worked and she borrows over somebody she drives it up the pitch and then every time she drops it onto her right foot it goes exactly where she wants it to go and, and they're so clever I mean they, they they will take a personal foul when they have to yeah. they, they're technically so good they will do what has to they know the danger I mean again going back refer back to the men's game if if uh, Kerry were clever enough when Merchant was r r driving down someone should have took a black card for that yeah. you know what I mean whereas the Dublin ladies he, Mick has them in a situation where they're clever out I mean Lauren McGee I think she had 13 personal fouls still didn't get a yellow card clever everything was clever and I admire that that's great it's it's been clever and they they they, they spread it so well and they spread their 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 risk taking as I call it so, you know yeah. they, they, they'll risk maybe giving a foul away there deliberately to stop. They see the danger. So their game awareness is so high. They can see where the dangers are coming and they, they, they give a foul away. If not, Now, they don't go into foul. They go in to mm. get the tackle. But if they have to, they will foul. And that's game awareness and that's good management and that's good preparation. And it's also good um, game management from the players. Yeah, so it took obviously over 22 minutes to get the score. It was a bit of a deflection in the end that... I think the defender blocked it off Goldrick's thigh and it went up over the keeper. Galway responded with a nice point, but then I think Lindsay Davies just sort of set the tone in. Like it was 14 seconds in, she wins the break, kicks it forward, drives on again and puts it over. And it's like Dublin got the first point and they were up and running then at that stage. And it was actually Davy who set up the next goal and it was Davy who set up Sinead Heron's point as well. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'm sure... They won't look back in a jet, but when, when Galway look back in it, I mean, the second goal, it's, uh, I mean, I played full back all life, my life myself and to let someone on the inside and get around the inside of you is just criminal, you know. Yeah. And uh, I would say they'll, they'll look at that and be very annoyed over that. I mean, at one stage it looked like the ball was dead and buried and then she, Lindsay goes around and goes yeah. back on the inside of her and there was no danger at that stage I mean you use your sideline and you make sure she goes out or has to turn back one or the Take other the point, like, yeah. and, and, and just make sure you know that they don't get a, a goal scenario but again that's where Dublin are brilliant they get into the position and no hesitation right across the goals you know there's question marks whether she was in the box or not it's irrelevant, you know. It's it's done, yeah. and, and, and I think I, I think Lindsay might have passed it from inside the box. That might have been what what saved O'Neill when she put yeah, it in. Yeah, possibly. I possibly. think she got it so far in that she was inside the small box and passed uh, it across. Possibly. I mean, it's it, it's irrelevant. But what I'm saying, the awareness, she yeah. could have took a point herself, uh, hand passed the point. Yeah. But awareness to get across is, is is phenomenal, and they work on that over. And that's not by accident. They work on that. If you look at all their goals throughout the year, the amount of them are passed across the box yeah. are huge, huge. So they always have a second runner coming. Into, you know, Whereas you, you'd see a lot of teams, including ourselves, and be going, oh yeah, you go and do it. Whereas Dublin give a second option all the time and it's phenomenal. It's really, really good at, at doing that. What would you do like for somebody like David? Because that, that goal, she started at left half forward. It was a sideline kick at the other side of the pitch and she actually just ran the whole way into the far corner and picked up the ball and took it around. Well, you can't point. really man-mark someone like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? You can't man-mark a half half forward. Yeah. So, I mean, she's just a, a phenomenal player and her ball awareness and where the ball's going is tremendous. So she, it's it's a very hard to contain that. The only thing you would say is you'd have to stop her early um, yeah. and not let her get back on the ball. 
you know, so make a redundant higher up the field, mm. you know, and if you're going to sacrifice a player, sacrifice to run with her then rather than let her go again and, and pick yeah. her up later on. So that's the only thing you could do there if she gives a ball off is to, to man mark her there and check her and go with her from there. Um, but again, cute players and clever players like that are very hard to mark. Yeah. Did you think there was any stage that Galway could have gotten back into it? What would you have done if you were like Tim there on the sideline? Would you have changed anything up? Well, you'd, you'd change your structure. I mean, you'd... you'd, you'd uh, I, I would have pressed up more on Dublin's kickouts. Um, I would have gambled for it at that stage and not have anyone sit back and gamble on trying to turn over some of their kickouts and have, have fast played in and try and play the game in their half rather than let them have short kickouts. I'd press up and then press up them. Like every time Dublin kicked the ball out, the whole people beyond where the ball was were already turned back and jogging back. Yeah. And and I would have took some gambles there. I would have took some risks. I wouldn't have went back unless one of the Dublin players went back. I would go man on and have a go at them. Um, you would nothing to lose at that stage. Mm. You know, the game, you're not recovering from, you're not recovering from five points down or four points down unless you get scores. You know, four points is a big lead in ladies football. You need scores. So you need to push up in them. So what if you, if you concede some more, at least you have to have a goal. Yeah, so there was one stage, I think Galway had a free, and like this is late on now, they needed a goal just to get back into it. And they still, like double had everybody back at this stage just to like make sure no goals and we'll see the game out. And Galway kept like five or six players sort of minding the midfield and they were turning around and pointing. It's like, what are you doing? Like just, no, you have to throw a caution to the window. As you said, there's nothing to lose. And like Dublin have six more players and you. So the ball got lumped in, broke down and of course the Dublin player won it. We, we've drove people mad all year, Mayo. We had a tactic this year to push up, including our wing backs, push right up on, mm. on all kickouts and we got so much reward from it. And at that stage in the game, and I understand the whole uh, negativity and mind in the house and the whole lot, but at that stage of the game, you have to really push up. I mean, yeah. at that stage when she was taking the free, I'd say, well, she's not going to get a goal. She's going to get a point. Now push up for the kick out and let's win the ball again. Yeah. Like push everybody up. Have a, have a goal, even if we have to expose our backs. You know, let's have a go and try and get the ball back. And if you get two scores in a row in ladies football, it's a lot. The kick out becomes really, really hard to take. Yeah. So if they put the free over and then recovered and got another score, well then, who knows what could could happen? But you won't win a game by having a tactic to put on you in full forward to try and put a high ball in. Sure, Dublin had three people to yeah. knock the ball down. That's, it was, that's you know you're not going to win that. And Anya was causing some bother, but yeah, like yeah, she's completely yeah, outnumbered. And she's completely outnumbered. Yeah, and you know she's not a, a, a natural full forward either. You know, mm. so it it becomes a, a, a very difficult situation. You know, and you don't see too many people catching ball high off over people in ladies football because they don't have the IAB. Uh, twitch muscles to get that high off yeah. people as well so I mean Ash Maloney probably would be the, the freak in that because <laughs> yeah. she's she's an amazing athlete but you know it's not there's not too many people can get up and, and get a high ball in and even if you get it you're not you're going to be surrounded by three people by, at that stage to actually score a goal you know so yeah I, I get it and, and you know a flick on or whatever could have got them a goal but um I just I think I think they didn't see uh, maybe listen they were first all Ireland in a long long time maybe the belief wasn't there mm. you know we all think we have the belief but when it comes out to it you know you mightn't have had the belief in, in your in yourselves to to, to yeah. get over the line like we we play Galway all the time and they're a phenomenal team and you know we we'd have huge I, I said it to all the girls coming off the pitch I said to all the girl, Galway girls believe in yourselves and go on and win it and you know I, I individually went around them and said just believe in yourself and go on and win it and. From my point of view, I'd be disappointed that they didn't really go for it. Yeah. You know, I, we can all say they did, but technically they didn't believe enough to actually have a go at them. Yeah. Great stuff, Peter. Um, we'll chat to Noel Healy next. All right, so I'm delighted to be joined in studio by All Ireland winner Noel Healy, your fourth All Ireland, third in a row. I have to say, Noel, I was getting a bit worried because every time I went on the social media, I just saw an other post from the boar's head or <laughs> another drink, and I was like, is she going to show up here? She, am I going to get a guest in, in the morning? <laughs> oh, yeah, touch and go, thank you. Yeah. No, we live in very south. Uh, but, yeah, it was, it's a brilliant few few days, all right, yeah. Your throat is holding up. It's hanging on by a thread, but it's holding up for you. Yeah, yeah, too much singing, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to shout over the bar. Uh, yeah, but it, this actually is better than it was yesterday, <laughs> thankfully. It was, it was on strict voice rest over the night. Oh, uh, yeah, and, like, what what was the sort of routine? You, you, the boar's head seems to be a bit of a tradition now, does it? Like, how did that happen, like... 
don't, I don't know. I was, I was saying um, I, was my, one of my favourite things about Shane Larry when he won the British Open. It was like he just celebrated like any team who would win in All Ireland. <laughs> yeah. Like his day two in the Boar's yeah. Head, then went home and had his homecoming. Uh, like Huey is from St. Bridget's, so my club, so I'd kind of know him from that. Uh, and he's he's good friends with Ken Robinson, our strength and conditioning coach. Yeah. So that's what kind of where our link is. That's why why we would go. Um, I suppose it's it's probably had started off in that it was a, a quieter pub that you know yeah. you'd expect everybody to go to to Coppers or Flannery. Yeah, so yeah. people probably went there to try to go a little bit under the radar. Yeah. But um, I'd say like you know when the lads are there, I think Capel Street is nearly <laughs> overflowing. <laughs> Um, and we didn't expect anybody to be there on Monday, but the place was still hopping. People were still buzzing over the weekend. So yeah. um, that was brilliant. And like you'd be celebrating with the lads in some of these pubs and stuff as well, would you? Um, not strictly. It would kind of overlap, I suppose, with Neve and Dean and Con yeah. and Aoife. They'd kind of come and, and say hello and you'd end up in the same places. But uh, no, there wasn't any kind of... We didn't cross over any like, <laughs> strict joint celebrations. Yeah, and do you have your own Kevin Mack in the panel? Somebody bring a guitar or anything like that? Uh, we, not this year, Katie Murray would have been our uh, singer last year. Um, but, you know, we kind of give some half renditions of Wonderwall and the, the, the <laughs> usual ones. It yeah. wasn't me anyway, that's not my last one. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, like, your, your, your voices sound like you were singing a lot of Wonderwall over the last <laughs> couple of days. Do you have a team song or anything like that? I remember we had a weird one back home. It was Return of the Mac for the club team. I don't know how it happened, but it was just played a night after you win a big game, you know, and then that sort of yeah. is adopted by the team. Uh, we have three of them that we actually sung in the Because you're winning that much. Yeah, yeah, that's how we do things now. Um, the first one is actually Lily Allen's Not Fair. Oh, yeah. Believe it or not. And anytime anybody asks, they're like, have you a team song to sing? Like when we did the... Uh, the documentary The Blue Sisters one they're like oh, what song do you usually sing after you win and we we're like not appropriate <laughs> <laughs> like, not that one uh, and then the dog days are over I suppose oh, yeah, and that's then uh, Abba Gimme 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 is always a good one uh, as well. I'm actually getting goosebumps thinking about how fitting the dog days are because yeah. obviously three losses in a row to three wins in a yeah, row yeah. Yeah, well tell me how, you, how is Cork treating you? good yeah um, settled in I've there uh, eight months now nine months now um, so it's good, yeah. I certainly won't miss the M8 and the garages <laughs> along the way. Um, but no, it's really good. Uh, it's a really great city. Um, the two hostels that I'm working in are, are really nice, like great for kind of for learning and things like that. Um, and then obviously with the club as well, um, that's been brilliant getting to know the girls. Um, and just getting to experience kind of a different club um, environment and like different club championships and stuff like that as well. Yeah, so you're with Moore and Abbey and is, uh, is Shane Renane, is he still in charge there? He's a manager there as well, yeah. Is he's temporary yeah. manager? He is, yeah. Some yeah. experience. He's had, he's had some success like with UCC as well. Um, obviously got to the semi-final of the O'Connor Cup uh, this year or and, you know, uh, tip now of two intermediate championships and then obviously Moore and Abbey won the All-Ireland Club last year. So, um you know, he's, 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 he's a brilliant coach. He's very good. He'd be quite similar to Mick in that he would focus a good bit on kind of the skills and he really yeah. kind of coaches skills and things like that. So that's great. And what, what would be, um, even just like personally living, like what would be the difference between Cork and Dublin? Traffic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, it takes me 10 minutes to go to work in the morning as opposed to the, the usual hour commute. Yeah, this, is, this is something... So, People are always talking about, you know, uh, footballers who are living in Dublin don't have to commute. Yeah. I, I don't think like they appreciate it enough. I remember going to a game in Ballymun, which isn't that far away yeah. from the centre, and it took an hour. Like, and if I was back in Derry, like an hour would be from the top of the county to the bottom of the county. Yeah, because we had one match out in uh, Clannacilty in West Cork, and uh, there it was like oh, 60 kilometres or something, it took like 45 minutes. I was like, I don't know how long it would take me to go from Fox Rock to Castle Knock if yeah. I was playing a match. <laughs> It's a nightmare, yeah. The M50. <laughs> yeah. And what is your like your everyday life? Is, is that changed much like, now that you're living in Cork? Uh, no, not really. It's just the same, um, same routine. Yeah. Don't yeah. Change too much. So you're an, an anaesthetist. Yeah. I had to actually Google the pronunciation of that before yeah, 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 <laughs> before yeah, yeah, I went yeah. on there. <laughs> Siri. Yeah. So what what does that entail exactly? Uh, so we work between theatre and the ICU, so the intensive care unit. So. Um, we are either the people who are putting you asleep when you're going for an operation and looking after you um, and kind of making sure that you've good pain control and things like that while you're asleep or we um, yeah we work in the intensive care unit so anyone who's critically unwell um, would come to us and we look after them yeah and it is like I take it I saw a memory talking about the 24 hour shifts you were doing last mm -hmm. Christmas I, I take it it's just a grueling sort of job that you're in 
Um, yeah, it's it's demanding. Uh, I think you know there's a lot of places that are kind of trying to um, get that work life balance a little bit better and kind of reduce the hours. Unfortunately, we don't have the staff to be able to do that. Mm. Um, so it's just a little, a little bit limited in terms of our staff numbers. But um, no, it's great. Like I mean, it's, it's it's a challenging job, but it's really rewarding as well. Um, you know, you'd 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 come you'd get a, a good bit of job satisfaction from it. Like obviously, there's there's nights where you've kind of you've difficult cases or things didn't go the way that you'd like them to go and that can be kind of it was emotionally hard to take mm. as well but um oh it's 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 good I couldn't really see myself doing anything else is football important like f- more so for you than to be able to leave that stuff in the job in the workplace like I'd say it's hard not to take your job home but is that where football comes into it yeah I think so I think like a lot of the girls on our team we've, we're, we're a little bit older now so we kind of are getting to the crux of our career like Sinead, Sinead Ahern working with KPMG would put in huge hours. Um, and same with like you know Sinead Goldjack, Siobhan McGrath, like working at tough four, like three or four in the morning sometimes. Um, and I think yeah, for them it's just nice. Like we always say, it's it's quite rare that you get to spend you know four evenings a week with your mates, yeah. and it's got like that's what's a great thing about football is you've this designated time you know to have a bit of a laugh with your friends, get a bit of exercise in, and just clear the head. And then interesting like yeah, so people would. And I'd be probably guilty of it sometimes. Like it's just football or it's just sports, not that important. Yeah. But in the grand scheme of things, it is probably like the best thing that we do and that it's just this deliberate distraction that we've created. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, I think so. I think it's nice to kind of just be very focused on, you know, the next play, the next play, the next yeah. play. It's a, it's a nice kind of, as I said, to just head clear, just kind of forget about whatever is going on. Yeah, all you're obsessed about is chasing after a football like, yeah. or winning a jersey back. And yeah, then. yeah. I know, I mean, I can go the flip side as well. I know football can be quite stressful for some people as well. Um, so you kind of just need to get that balance. So how are you finding playing with Dublin and living in Cork are you are you coming up for all the sessions what way is it working for you uh, no I wouldn't be um, or like just you can't exactly yeah. be like I'll just leave a little work a little bit earlier today <laughs> um, and it takes t- like it's you know a three hour journey so you wouldn't get up midweek so I train with the club or just do a, a session on my own um, during the week and if I'm not working weekends then try to, to get up for training um and yeah, like Mick was 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 really good about it. He kind of he was he never put any you know massive pressure on me to have to try and make it to certain sessions. Um, you just kind of have to try prioritize what sessions you need to make it make it to. Yeah, and even that's probably difficult. Obviously, working in the hospitals. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not like I thought. Leo Radiker said that you all get annual leave whenever you want to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> In the, during the busy times yeah, yeah. You, I kind of ended up using most of my annual leave to try and make it up for, to come up to training that's incredible and tell me like, do, do you miss St Bridget's I'm sure like you know you've been like sort of thrown into the more nabby way of life mm. but like, uh, when I left Derry uh, f- the thing I found hardest was leaving the club behind and I, I realised you need to get a bit of a, a life <laughs> outside of the club because that was yeah. all I was doing back in Derry yeah I, like, like any time I've, I've been back in Castanoc um you know, I'd meet I'd meet up with a few of the girls that I would have played with and obviously Kira Trant uh, plays with Dublin and still play with Bridget's so you'd always be asking how everyone's getting on, who's playing well, what like what matches they have coming up. Um and yet like when the the club championship was on at the start of the year there, uh, at the start of the summer, uh, I did miss it, yeah. I kinda like I went down to watch one of their matches and it was kinda just was very strange sitting on the sideline. But um I kinda like I knew that I wasn't gonna be able to make like all mm. the matches at midweek for club. Um yeah. ironically because it, when it was set up initially they were all players who would have come from the country who would have come down. So they would have been around at weekends. So that's <laughs> apparently the the way it's set up was kinda kicked <laughs> it hasn't worked it hasn't worked for me. But um yeah, like I I think it's 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 nice to have a, a base down in Cork as well, to kinda have that like a, a little bit of a community and kind of a little bit of um uh, yeah, it was a, a base down there and something to kind of ground you there as well. And then does it start to feel a bit more like home then because of Moran Abbey? Like, are you there yet? You probably feel more so now that the county season's over. Yeah, yeah, it's less awkward. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it is. It's nice. It's just to, to kind of to have... It means that you're kind of not always looking up to, to Dublin and trying to get back to Dublin to see to get to get to training or to see your friends. It means that you do have to stuff that's going on down there, so it's easier to kind of make it a bit more of a life down there. Yeah, and you've been playing with um with a torn hamstring. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> how's that been going for you? How how did this come about first? Uh, I just tweaked it at the start of the summer and was kind of it was fine for most of it. 
um, pulled it again in, in the Kerry match um, but kind of played on through like, and I kind of didn't really realise how bad it was um, and then we got a scan done on it the week after and we kind of ha- didn't realise how bad it, w- it was well it wasn't that bad chair, but kind of the, the extent of, of the tear and then um, it was just a little bit of a race against time I suppose to get to the Cork match uh, those injuries usually take about four, four to six weeks, and I had ten days <laughs> to, to, to try <laughs> heal it. That's a that's a tough race, no? Yeah, so uh, we kind of had a few uh, extreme uh, re- recovery and healing processes going on, but uh, yeah, I, like I, we kind of just took a gamble in the cork match to see if it would stand up. I did, I um, did some sprinting on the Friday beforehand, and it felt okay. Uh, so yeah, we just kind of crossed our fingers and hoped that. Like if if I had to co- to come in to, to the match that it would last and I got about twenty five minutes out of it before I started feeling it again, um. So we, you know we got through that match and we had three weeks which we kind of felt would be enough time to get a, a good stint out of it, um. So I was talking to Mick last weekend and he said that they felt that they only had a certain amount of time to get out of it before it was at, at risk of kind of going again or being yeah. injured again or just fatiguing, um. So he said that he'd prefer to f- to finish the match with me than to 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 start and I've kind of I suppose done all Ireland's in every which way of come yeah. on with like you know when I when my first season with two minutes to go to to lose a final to win a final I've started finals that we've lost and I've started finals that we've won and you know the best feeling has always been on the pitch the at the end um and you know to be able to kind of contribute in any way that you could and to be seen that you can contribute um you know is is, is special so I was you know happy enough like y- you say. In the court games so at the semi final, twenty five minutes before you started feeling it again. Mm. But we're talking about a torn hamstring here, so like, what did you feel? Like you're feeling your hamstrings torn again? Uh, it just started getting a pain in it. Yeah. So the first time I did, I just kind of felt a pop, and I was, I hold, I was, I was with the ball, and I was running, and I kind of was like, I think my hamstrings just torn. But I was like, <laughs> I have the ball, so I'll just keep running, and I was kind of able to accelerate through it. So I was like, it doesn't really make much sense. And even the physio was like, this is the most bizarre. <laughs> Injury, um, but yeah, uh, like, yeah. <laughs> and then what? So obviously you're thinking was, well, there's only two games left, so I might as well just risk it. Is that what you were thinking? Yeah, yeah. Well, like I was, like in All Ireland semi final, you kind of have to treat it like it's an All Ireland final. You can't yeah. hold anything back. And that's the physio said to me. She was like, you know, if you play, you you're at risk of like making it worse and putting yourself out for the final. And I was like, well, like I can't think about that. You can't be protecting yourself for a game that you're not even guaranteed. Um, so yeah like thankfully it all just paid off I suppose like when you look at Nicole Owens who was in the same situation um, coming into the Cork match and unfortunately it didn't go for her um, the way that we all would have liked you know Yeah. and she put in huge huge amount of work to kind of get herself to that situation and Siobhan Colleen as well who you know had a stormer of a club championship last year and then just a freak injury just yeah. whatever way she twisted of all her hamstring off the bone and had to have surgery and you know was in a brace for twelve weeks of the of the summer so you know I'd kind of I'm like at the very opposite like you know the the the, the other end of the the scale there oh yeah the other end just with a torn hamstring just yeah. you know nothing nothing to it really yeah, I just um, get on with it yeah 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 to there like sucking up now I was like yeah, suck it up and well tell me like so you picked the right half to come on anyway in the All Ireland final yeah um, obviously there was a few more scores yeah, going the on score and half, yeah. yeah um. What were, you, what were you thinking? So you're on the, the bench at this stage getting absolutely drenched. I might add. It flashed at a big screen at one stage and it was just read a picture of you with the, Snowed, the yeah. hood over. Yeah, you could just see your eyes coming yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. I didn't realise the subs can get soaked in yeah, that situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, usually when you're watching a game, you can kind of see where you can come in and what can you do and, you know, what, what changes you'd make or what needs to be fixed. And, like, I remember watching me, like, I suppose, like, don't slip, <laughs> catch the ball. I was like... It was a really bizarre game, and even at halftime, we were analysing it. You know, I think the weather added to the kind of it was almost just a little bit frantic nature. And then when the scores aren't coming, people probably was starting to, to to panic a little bit. But um, yeah, it was it it was a kind of it was a strange game to come into. But I think the second half um probably opened up a, a little bit. And I think we got a score, you know, straight from the throw, which probably really settled us. Mm. Um, but I think you know it just kind of. I, people probably would focus a lot on like oh, it, was, it was a poor game because it wasn't that many scores the forwards were doing well but I mean if you look back and you look at some of the hits that the girls were putting in some of the tackles that the backs were putting in and even just like the di- the discipline from from both sides really you know to not give away freeze um, in, in, a, in a day like that I think it was probably 
um, it was probably a, a day for the backs and kind of hi- highlighted a lot of the, the, the good defensive work and the talented defenders that are um, so on both teams. Yeah, it's sort of, for me, it made it more impressive um, Han O'Neill's performance because, like, yeah, like, Galway had a lot of bodies back and the uh, defending was amazing from, from both teams. Yeah. But, like, Hannah was just buzzing around. She was a ball of energy just picking up, like, you know, all these balls everywhere. Like, yeah. you know, you couldn't couldn't stop her. No, yeah, she was absolutely, like, she's, well, that's Hannah, I suppose, a ball of energy is a good, is a good <laughs> description for her. Um, yeah, like, look, like, it, starting your first match of the year starting not your first All-Ireland final you'd forgive anyone for being a little bit nervous but she just you know, she doesn't look nervous at all not like. at all so she was so composed you know even to to see Sinead Goldick for the pass yeah. was brilliant to take her own goal as well um, phenomenal some of the you know the work that she put in track and back even yeah you're right the runs that she was making it was a very tough day for her and Sinead Hearn particularly in the first half mm. just trying to create any space that they could um, but yeah, she was, she was really, really good. Let's talk about your your celebration because you were in the air there for a <laughs> long time. Like I must say, it was an un- unbelievable score, especially considering the the game that was. And then you just like found us, I don't know, found this bit of road and, and went at it. And you turned and you kept going and a fantastic finish. But yeah, it was a great celebration. I thought the celebration made the score as well. Yeah. You jumped up into the air, turned around as you jumped, fist pump. It was, it was proper, proper celebration. Yeah, uh, Nicole Owens was slagging me because uh, <laughs> I, I haven't scored in the last two All-Ireland finals. And she was like, you finally got your point. <laughs> <It's> like, yeah, <laughs> I was over-celebrated point. Um, but yeah, I think, I don't know, is it just a uh, little bit of the frustrations of kind of coming into the week? And then obviously we just had worked so hard to try to get any kind of score you know, it was only our third point um, of the match we'd done really good work defensively but we were probably just giving away ball a little bit cheaply we weren't um, holding on to it too well in the forwards we'd hit the post we'd hit wides um, so I think it was just when points were that hard to come by um, I think uh, the, the point probably sealed it for us a little bit and I think I, I was talking to Sinead Gojic and she'd kind of said you know once that, once that point went over she's like I felt like we had like we kind of had it at that stage yeah. now we know better than anyone like you know an yeah. all-around final isn't over until it's over <laughs> yeah. um, unfortunately but uh, yeah I think it kind of just one of those um, a, a, a score that kind of helps like you know cement it a little bit No it was definitely it was, it was definitely significant in the game and I, w- I would say yeah, it was significant for you personally as mm. well like do you, do you think like the, that it's harder living in Cork and um, with the the work that you do to stay at this level that you're at it must be because I get <laughs> injured yeah <laughs> um, yeah like I, I, like the we're lucky in Dublin and that like there's three colleges that you can go to in Dublin there's a lot of jobs mm. in Dublin so people we generally just don't really have to leave it's not it's, you know it kind of goes without saying it's like oh so you're going to UCD or DCU or like DIT <laughs> yeah. you know when the girls are saying where like a lot of the other girls would have to you know, go to either UL or UCC or Galway. Um, there's travelling involved in that. There's study as well. You know, they might be living out of home for the first time. Uh, so I suppose it's probably the first time from the Dublin perspective that it's been experienced. But um, I think, you know, there's girls that are doing it constantly. There's people, there's club players that are doing it as well, travelling up and back. Um, and that's kind of the nice thing, I suppose, about Gaelic is that there is that kind of, that loyalty and that kind of... Um, yeah, it was loyalty to to where you're from, and you know that pride to to represent mm. where you're from, no matter where you are. So you said afterwards on um, TG Kehr that it's been a it's been a really tough year for us and for members of the panel. Like, what what's what did you mean by that? I think everybody on our team has, has had a, a bit of a struggle. Um, the two girls who had their their injuries um was difficult. I think some of the girls at work um probably under came under a little bit of pressure with that. They were finding it hard to to juggle. Um to juggle that uh, you know some people just had family things that were going on that kind of took a toll on them and I think we'd probably been lucky in previous years that it was a little bit of a seamless journey through the summer whereas this time you know there was a lot of moments that could really have tripped us up um, and I, I think that's what made this one that little bit more special and a little bit more important in that we really all just kind of there was, a, there was a lot of times where people just needed somebody to put an arm around the shoulder and kind of pull them with them or just say like look you take your break I I have, I'll, I have this um, so that just kind of made it that, that, that bit special yeah and I remember you talked about the Blue Sisters documentary there I remember watching that and the, the impact it had on people just watching at home and when you consider like so many like 
females drop out of sport mm. earlier than, than men would and more so than men would for all different reasons and then I can see it in Crow Park like I've seen it the last three years when Dublin win and the celebrations and what it means to you but I can see it in the eyes of all these like children and women who are looking on and it's like geez, that that's class it'd be brilliant to have that how important is that in your life? I think I yeah everybody always says that like sport is very important and whatever like the fitness thing from the health point of view I think people don't really appreciate the benefit of having a team and being involved in a team sport there is just something very special about knowing that other people are working to help you achieve something and you're willing to to work and kind of give up sacrifice things like that to you know help somebody else achieve it and I think it's like it's a it's a support network as well as much as anything um and I, I think it's unfortunate that girls would would lose that um if they were to leave particularly in you know your formative years are kind of your 14 15 16 they're probably some of the hardest years that yeah. you go through as well you're you're kind of finding your your feet you're finding you know who you are um and i think sport kind of takes away a lot of that you're when you're on a pitch as you kind of show with a fist bump you know you your emotions are very you can't really hide them things are happening too quickly and um it's kind of you you really kind of expose yourself, I suppose, to sports. So, you, you know, people see you at your best and they see you at your worst. And I think it's kind of easier to be more open with people when you've kind of had that relationship with them. And I think that's what we found anyway with each other, that, you know, we're, we're it's easier for us to, to be open with each other and to kind of help open up to, to each other. And then I suppose you have that extra support network and that's just been really important for us. Yeah, absolutely. And I take it... Uh the partying's over now, is it? Well, what's the next step for you? Are you heading back to the Boar's Head or are you heading back to Cork? No, <laughs> heading to Houston Station. <laughs> um, oh yeah, I'll get the train back home tonight. Uh, I think the, the partying's over f- for all of us. The two of the girls have club matches tonight. Uh, <laughs> who are playing scaries. Um, then the, the rest of the girls have their club championship on Monday. Um, there's, you know, ructions in the camp yesterday. Siobhan McGrath went to club training, so... The, the Fox Rock Cavantilly girls were in too happy about that. Um, and then I have club championship on Saturday with Moore Abbey. So it's kind of, it's back to clubs, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, Noel, thanks very much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure and congratulations again. No worries at all. Thanks very much. All right, so Paddy Power's performance of the weekend. Um, first up, you mentioned her, Ashley Maloney, like, she is just a, a bit of a freak, right? Uh, like Niall McIntyre did an interview with her uh, club coach. She was saying like she's good enough to play on the men's team. Absolutely. Uh, Orla Dwyer as well for, for yeah, Tipperary was, was here, phenomenal. Yeah. I thought she was phenomenal. Um, Marie Curley for Tipperary did a great job at full back as well. Mm. I mean, we're inclined to always talk about forwards, you know. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, you have to put backs in. I mean, uh, Marie Curley for, for Tipperary was, was brilliant. Uh, I thought uh, Goldrick was brilliant for Dublin. Um, but there's the standout player for me I mean if you're asking me who the standout player mm-hmm. for me for the whole weekend uh, I'd have to go with Lindsay Davy. I, I, I just her tracking back her movement her I mean the senior game wasn't it wasn't a day for forwards so you know forwards aren't going to get too much credit it was a real backs display and I you know being a full back myself I'd normally want to pick a back uh, <laughs> but if if I was marking Lindsay Davy, I'd be driven mad completely. You know, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. It would be w- in one of them situations. And you know, Ash Maloney w- w- was tremendous. Orla Dwyer was tremendous. Um, but to me, Lindsay Davy was the st- the standout performer on on, on the whole weekend. And for a p- poor final, yeah, her performance was outstanding. I do I do have uh, for the, to represent the backs. I have Sarah Lynch and Sinead Burke down there. I thought they were the Sinead Burke is, is a standout everywhere she goes. I mean, she's one of the best man markers in in, in the country, and she's uh, she's phenomenal. Um, I would and and all Galway's backs are tremendous. You know, same as all Dublin backs are tremendous. I mean, it it what probably you should be picking out backs in a, in a situation, but. The marking was so good both sides, it's hard to pick any, yeah. a, anyone out from the backs, you know. And then when someone stands out, like Lindsay, when the game needed to be brought to anyone, when it needed to be set alight, she was the one that really set it alight um, to win in the final. So that's the way I would pick her. Yeah, I have, um, uh, you said Sinead Goldrick, she's on the list. Hannah O'Neill, uh, I just thought she was uh, her movement. As, her movement is incredible, oh, incredible, and, and she's so a busy, important. busy bee. Yeah, and she, like actually, that's just um, what Noel was saying about how she's a ball of energy off the pitch as well. And she actually <laughs> told me um, that there was one stage during the game 
she noticed that Neve McAvoy's mascara had run down and she shouted over to her and told her to, to rub it and just got a dirty look off Neve. But just, yeah. the, the idea you'd, is she wasn't even thinking this is a lot You'd wonder why thing. she was wearing mascara in the first place, wouldn't <laughs> <Yeah>. you? <laughs> but just like, you know, like Hannah O'Neill didn't seem to care of the occasion here. She was yeah, just enjoying yeah, herself. I know she's a future star and uh, she's hard mark and she's a, a live bunny and, you know, the occasion didn't get to her. That, yeah. The occasion definitely didn't get to her. I, I, I You know, Lindsay would be... Uh, campaigner that's been there a long time and you expect it where I, I get where you're coming from yeah. and I get where Noelle's coming from um, she she hasn't been O'Neill hasn't been in this scenario yeah. before so it was tremendous that way that someone I mean youth is brilliant that way too and the way they've managed her, the youth as well Mick has managed the youth by giving them an odd bit of time yeah. an odd bit of time an odd bit of time and, and, and it's been very very good it's very good man management yeah but I do um, I do agree with you I think Lindsay Davy deserves it she yeah. was just unreal she was everywhere like She's a workhorse and also with a touch of class at the other side. She sold the dummy for Sinead Hearns. But she was just like putting people on their arses, just going by them with skill, with power. Like she's beaten you anyway, and I think she'll continue to do that for as long as she wants to. Yeah, and again, she'd be one of the players, I would say, at, at an age where she owes Dublin nothing, but in the condition she's in, I can't see her, you know, retiring anytime soon. Like she's phenomenal, yeah. you know, she's a phenomenal player and she's in unbelievable condition. Yeah, so congratulations, Lindsay. You are the Paddy Power Performance of the Weekend. Uh, Peter, before we wrap up, what is your situation? Are you going to stay on for another year of me? Yeah, well, I have two years left on on, on my, my contract, but I, I I'm we I have have to chat to the players, and we go and we'll we'll reassess what, what, where we are and how, and how we're going. I mean, the, I I have been doing quite a lot of uh, training with men's teams now, count, uh, club club teams around in in the adjoining counties, and I was even training last night a team, and I'm getting a grow back with the the men's games as well. So, um, I I I don't know what my situation is yet. Um, I love. Being involved with Mayo, they're a fantastic group of players and there's an All-Ireland in the players. So we'll sit down over the weekend and we'll chat about it and we'll see where we go from there. Do you think you can put a number on it? Or is there a percentage? Of, are you leaning on staying or looking to get into the uh, No, listen, it's it's like anything. There's an, when, uh, to take a, an inter-county team, there's a huge amount involved. I mean, you, it literally is a full-time job and it's... Uh, a lot a lot of work and it's a lot of emphasis on on so many different things and you know we would be way behind financially on on an, than an awful lot of other groups and that's a, a, something that comes on the head of the manager as well and there's an awful lot of work involved a huge amount of work involved away from the pitch um getting the, the the finances in getting the the things in place and you know it becomes quite hard and you know mm. I've had a bit of bad health this year as well which took a bit of, a bit of a knock on, on things and you know, puts an awful lot of things into perspective. But I, I, I have the appetite for it. You know, I have to sit with the girls and have a chat. And, you know, w we have an awful lot of disappointed girls. You know, they felt they, they should have been in an All-Ireland final. They felt they had done enough to be in an All-Ireland final. And then, you know, that creates its own questions as well. And, you know, we've had a turbulent couple of years as well uh, where we've regenerated ourselves and worked really, really hard. And that takes its toll on, on, on management and, and things of that. So... You know, it's something that I have to re-look at and, and, and refocus on it. But, you know, I, I believe in these girls and I think there's an All-Ireland in these girls and I think we're within a kick of a ball of being there and, and doing the job. And uh, we just have to sit and chat and see see what the, the future lies for us. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to give you a percentage of that. <laughs> <laughs> God's sake. Well, thanks a million for coming in. It's been a, it's been a pleasure having you. Thanks very much. Yeah, and congratulations to Dublin, the champions, again, three in a row. And that's it for another season of ladies football. But we're not going anywhere, so don't be leaving us. We're coming back on Monday and we're going to be with you right through the winter as well. So please bear with us. And I promise you, Willie will be back soon. See you later.